Okay, folks, well, good evening. We're going to get started a little early, and um, so glad to have Dr. Joe Martin back with us again. Uh, you know, he's with a group called Biblical Discipleship Ministries, a great uh, ministry if you're ever interested in supporting. He's not asking. I'm making a plug here. Uh, and the reason why is because they follow this really well. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. One thing I love about their ministry is they always say, well, what does the Bible say? <laughs> and you think, well, that's, that's simple. But sadly, most ministries that I've gotten in contact with don't really hold to that. So uh, if you'd like to support them, definitely. Um, what, what is y'all's website, by the way, if somebody wants to find out more about y'all? Okay, biblicaldiscipleship.org. They also mentioned if you wanted any of those books or uh, DVDs and back, you're welcome to pick up as you leave. And uh, beyond that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to find out more about your wonderful creation. Help us, Lord, as we um, just ingest all of this tonight, that we would uh, learn to be good biblicists, that we would seek to uh, follow the Savior. Uh, pray for Dr. Martin as he teaches. Give him just the right words. And Lord, we lift up all these things in the glory of the Son. In his name we pray it. Amen. that and uh, we try to put these videos together in a way that will uh, excellence bring excellence because the way the world does things it does things with excellence and we want to do it too so that's what we do and it's not cheap that's for sure but we we get it all done and I want to share one more quick one over here uh, maybe um, yeah, right here. Now, you have, a lot of you have young people into computers and stuff. Well, here's what one young man did. If I see it, where does it say hope? Anybody see it? Hope? Ah, there it is right there, hope. Okay, with a computer, you can put together a message and here's the way this one. This is uh, Carl Kirby, Reasons for Hope. If you've never heard Carl Kirby, Reasons for Hope, he really reaches the young people. Hope. 
That's a commonly used word around here. I hope my football team wins the Super Bowl. I hope Johnny asked me to prom. I hope it snows today so I don't have to go to school. I hope I get that job. I get that raise. I pass the test. I score the winning point. I get the car. I don't have to kiss Ann Hilga at Thanksgiving more seriously. I hope my friend gets better. I hope I do something great with my life. I hope one day there's world peace. Hope. We say it and we hear it all the time. And I don't want to trivialize it or disregard the aforementioned, but honestly, those are temporary things and they're uncertain at best. It's not that they aren't real or that they're wrong, but let's be honest, if your team doesn't win, Johnny doesn't ask you to prom. If it doesn't snow, you don't get that job or the raise or pass the test. If you don't get the car and Ann Hilga happens to smack a big wet one on you, you're going to get through it. And even if your friend doesn't get better, you don't do something great with your life. And even, even if there's never world peace, all of the outcomes are uncertain. And whether they happen or not, the way you want doesn't really change much in the grand scheme of things because it's all temporary. In the grand scheme of eternity, temporary hopes seem frivolous. See, hope in all the above scenarios is nothing more than a wish, like crossing your fingers, closing your eyes, and saying out loud, I hope I get that raise, I hope I get that raise, I hope I get that raise, is actually going to make a difference. I mean, you don't know what's actually going to happen at all, right? Yet we wish. We click our ruby heels together, we rub the rabbit's foot and avoid walking under ladders and all that, and we slowly open our eyes to see if the wish came true. Well, let me make a quick distinction. There are things we all hope for in the wishing sense, and then there are things we place our hope in. So can we really call uncertain, confidence-lacking, rolling the dice, closing your eyes, ruby clicking, rabbit foot rubbing, wishful thinking hope? Is that what hope is all about? And can we really place our hope in looks or fame or money or power? Shouldn't true hope, ultimate hope, eternal hope be based on truth, facts, something more than a wish, something I can know, be certain of, be confident in? I mean, if that kind of hope exists, then it can change us, encourage us, remove fear, relieve doubt, give us strength and get us through anything, give meaning and purpose to everybody, help us love more, understand more, forgive more, accept more, and it can inspire us to share the source of said hope to anybody and everybody. If that kind of hope exists, it changes everything. So does it exist? Yes, and I'll be blunt. It's only found in Jesus Christ because he is the way, the hope, and the life. All other hope is temporary, uncertain, wishful thinking at best. Oh, come on. What if I hope that every little thing's going to be all right? Or we all just become non-existent when we die, or that I'll get to heaven because I, I lived a good life. Well, rub the rabbit's foot and roll the dice, Jimmy. Those are uncertain wishes based on flimsy guesses. 1 Timothy 2.5.6 declares, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. John 3.16 states, Whoever believes in him, that is Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life, which is why Paul confidently wrote in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Without Christ, we are still dead in our trespasses and separated from God, which makes us godless and wicked. And Job chapter 27, verse 8 says, For what is the hope of the godless when God cuts him off, when God takes away his life? Without Christ, there is no real hope, period. So do me a favor and finish this sentence. I place all my hope in blank. If Jesus isn't in that blank, you have no hope. That pretty much covers it, folks, and I think we can safely say that this thought, this concept, this idea that you can have true hope without God has been debunked. Adios. So a little three-and-a-half-minute clip, and a young guy put that together. So you have children, grandchildren, uh, that like to do things on computers. Start find, finding a scripture and do something like that. Our, this younger generation knows how to do that kind of stuff. I don't. I know how to hit the button. That's it. <laughs> so let's see if we can get out of here and uh, get back to our talk for tonight. And let's see. I don't need that anymore. And now we'll see if it's still here. Uh, we're going there last, and we're going here first. Good. Okay, now, do we have a picture? Everything's working? Thank you very much. All right, so here's where we started four weeks ago, and we said our overriding question is, who do we believe? Do we believe people, or do we believe God? Do we believe the words of man, or the word of God? On the creation issue... There are two sets of words. The words of man, evolution, billions of years, or the word of God, creation, about 6,000 years. And then you have to decide, who do I believe? Okay? All right, now, I want to show you a couple flowers just to start tonight. You say, you already started. But here we go. A few orchids. There's somewhere around 30,000 different species of orchids in the, like the Amazon rainforest. Each orchid has its own individual pollinator. That means if there's 20,000 orchids, 
There's 20,000 bees or wasps or flies or different whatever to do the pollinating on that particular orchid. Fascinating. Okay, there's your white egret orchid, your angel orchid, the ballerina orchid, dancing girls orchid, parrot flower orchid, the dove orchid. Look down in that orchid. Do you see it? Little dove looking at you? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, there's your flying duck orchid. <laughs> yeah, they don't fly far, very far. They're hooked on. Uh, laughing bumblebee orchid. The happy alien orchid. Ooh, the painted or the red lips orchid. Is it? God, it's amazing. There's your monkey face orchid. Amazing. I mean, God had all these things thought up before he ever spoke anything into existence. There's your swaddling baby orchid. By the way, Luke chapter 2, about verse 12, when the angels, the angel announces to the shepherds, he says, what? You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Remember that? By the way, a lot of the new versions don't have swaddling. They just said, you'll find the babes rock, wrapped in cloths. Well, that doesn't tell them what manger. I mean, there could have been hundreds of mangers. It's an agricultural community back then. How do they know what manger? Well, because the babe is wrapped in swaddling cloths, and there were only swaddling cloths in one manger. And that was the manger. It was called Migdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock. That was the manger where the priest prepared the baby lambs to take them up to the sacrifice, two a day, okay? So, the angel says to these shepherds, probably the temple shepherds, you're going to find that babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. They didn't have to say, it's the one over there on the end of 10th Street. The babe is wrapped in swaddling cloths. That means the babe is wrapped in the cloths that appear in one manger, the manger where the sacrifices were prepared to take up to the sacrifice. So I believe it's 99% for sure Jesus was born in the very manger where the sacrificial lambs were prepared for the sacrifice. And so I thought I'd throw that one in there. Now we're going to do a little bit on evidences for a young earth. Okay. Um, if the days in Genesis are normal 24-hour days, and they are, and our Creator creates fully mature life forms, He did, Adam, full-grown, Eve, full-grown, trees, full-grown, mm, there they are, okay, uh, then is there true scientific evidence that the universe and the earth are actually only about 6,000 years old. Yes, there's tons of it. I never learned any of it in college, okay? Uh, so, I'm going to just read a quick list, and then we're going to go look at a few of them here. Elastic tissue, red blood cells in non-fossilized dinosaur bones. I showed you that. Carbon-14 in diamonds and coal. Can't be more than a few thousand years old, because there's carbon-14. Half-life, what is it? 5,730 years. If there's any left at all, it can't be very old. Uh, where, where does information come from? It's non-material, okay? How, how'd that come on the safe? How do you get information into a gene, out of a gene? You can't grab it and stick it in. You can't take a gene and pull information out. Now, you can change genes around and pull them out, but not the information. God had to put all the information into all the genes on the day he created it. So how did life get started? Well, there's a precise recipe, all right? It can't start in oxygen. It would be oxidized, the chemicals and everything. Uh, it can't be started without oxygen. They went to that for a while, the Miller-Urey exper experiments and everything, a reducing atmosphere. No oxygen. If there wasn't any oxygen, there wouldn't be any ozone layer. If there did life pop up, it would be burned toast in an instant. So they decided, no, it can't start that way. So they put it under the water, which they still have it. Life started under the water. Well, you can't do that either. Hydrolysis. It'll break down the amino acids. You can't form polypeptides and things like that. So the only option left is, in the beginning, God. But the evolutionists don't want to go there. Okay, But that's the only option, really. The irreducible complexity of the cell. It's all or nothing. 
It has to have all its parts. And there's all kinds of machines and delivery systems and cleansing systems and all kinds of stuff in the cell. I don't have time. We have a whole section on just the cell. We don't have time to get there. Spiral galaxies, if they're like 10 billion years old, they shouldn't be spiral galaxies. They have these arms that stick out. It should have all been already sucked in. Nah, they aren't. A few thousand years at the most. Size of the sun. They've measured it now for over 400 years. It's getting smaller. Well, how do the evolutionists get around that? Oh, well, you see, the sun expands and contracts. We've been measuring it for 400 years. It's been contracting. The next 400 years, it might start expanding. Well, what have we been able to test and measure? It's contracting. That's all we've ever seen. So the idea it could get big again is in the mind of the evolutionist, all right? Uh, then we also have the moon to planet Earth distance. It's increasing by about an inch and a half a year. Well, I mean, if the moon Earth system is like four and a half billion years old, the moon should be out of sight. I just saw it the other night. Full moon the other night. Lifespan of comets has to be less than 10,000 years. They can measure these things. The, the evolutionary scientists are the ones telling us this stuff. Uh, geostatic pressure from oil. Dry, you drill a well, you get a gusher. You still do. It shouldn't happen if it's millions of years old. Entropy. Everything is moving to less order and wearing out. Yeah, that's true. It is. Uh, human population. We're going to show you a chart on that in a second. Uh, we can't have this many people. Uh, if Well, we'll get there. Rapid growth of stalactites. It doesn't take thousands of years for a stalactite to grow. It just depends on how much water with how many minerals. You can grow a stalactite overnight, okay? And I have pictures here. Hopefully, we'll get to some of them. Polystrata fossils. That's a tree going up through multiple uh, sedimentary layers of mud, okay? Well, we're watching it happen at Spirit Lake since 1980. And we've always been told, oh, well, look at that. That's 250,000 years there. And then here's another forest up here. And then a, an ancient ocean came in and washed in this sediment. And then another grew up here millions of years. No, we're watching it happen. We can measure it. The Grand Canyon, they've now decided it was formed rapidly, not slowly over a long period of time. It wasn't slowly eroded. Now, they finally figured this out. The northern rim of the Grand Canyon is about 1,800 feet higher than the land north of it. Well, the river, if the river called it, uh, carved it out, the river would have to go uphill 1,800 feet and then start to erode it out. Well, we know things don't work that way, okay? So now the evolutionists are saying there was a huge lake up behind where the Grand Canyon is. And they say, we even have found the shoreline. Okay, maybe they have, several states. And then it broke, the dam broke and bam, Billions of gallons of water just bam right into that 1800 foot wall and just whoo, carved that canyon out almost overnight. All right, so does the Bible refute evolution? The Lord Jesus, the Creator Himself, refutes the molecules to man over millions and billions of years. He says this From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, Mark 10 6. And we talked about that before. He's not speaking male and female blue green algae. The context of Mark 10 is divorce, and blue-green algae do not get divorces. People do. So according to Jesus, there were male and female people since the beginning of the creation. Okay, now, human population. Um, about 4,400 years ago, we had eight people on planet Earth. This is right after the flood. It took until about the year 1800 to get the first one billion people on planet Earth. Okay? Well, then it took about 130 years to get the next billion, 32 years to get the next billion, eight, 15 years to get the next billion, 8 years to get the next billion, then birth control kicked in, took 15 years to get the next billion. Now we're at 2022, and they're telling us now it's 8 billion. Okay? Just looking at human population, this earth cannot be more than a few thousand years old, or we would have people stacked all the way out to the sun, okay? It can't happen, absolutely cannot happen. And by the way, if God had not made his, what we call environmental cleanup systems, I don't know, did we have any of those back there today? 
We might have one or two back there, a DVD. He has something that's going to eat anything that was ever alive, like all the way down to the chemicals. That's why we don't go out in the woods and we have to dig our way through a thousand miles of leaves that never decayed. You see, every year God cleans it up, cleans it up, cleans it up. He has something to do every single speck of it. All right, we already looked at that, so I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, here, we'll go here. So, Mount St. Helens blows up, and then this 600-foot deep canyon formed almost overnight when a mud flow came down and blasted that right out of there. And then in Spirit Lake, here comes these trees. And they get waterlogged, and the root end is heaviest, so it drops. And it's like they grew there. They just drop down. They, they float standing up for a while, then they drop down. And so they drop down. And then now they've discovered these trees have dropped down according to their species. So it would look, if you came here a million years from now and looked, and you believed in evolution, you would say, ah, oh, that particular forest, they're all the same tree. Uh, something happened, and they got uh, flooded. And then it dried out, and there was more trees uh, starting to grow. And no, we're watching it with our eyes since 1980. There's a bank over there in France, and trees all the way up through all these layers. Oh, hundreds of thousands of years for that to happen. No, it doesn't take that. There's a 30-foot tree going up through. Actually, there's two coal seams, one toward the top, one here at the bottom. That doesn't happen. Uh, if it's millions of years, that, that tree wouldn't be there. Uh, is the lava dome at Mount St. Helens really millions of years old? It's what they've told us. Well, they checked some of that rock when it was about 10 years old. They didn't tell them where it came from. One of the best dating labs. And the report came back. It's somewhere between, what was it, 380,000, I think, or 350,000 and 2.8 million years old. No, it's only 10 years old by their own way of doing it, okay? These dating techniques are way out on assumptions. I get it. I have a chapter in my book on that. Did we put any books out? Okay, if you didn't get my book, we want every family to have one, okay? They're back there, one, one per family, hopefully. Rocks of known age. Radioisotope uh, isotope dating doesn't seem to work, like Mount St. Helens. Rocks of unknown age, like the moon. Radioisotope dating is assumed to work. Huh. Well, who's going to prove it's wrong, okay? You're not going to go to the moon. You can't go back and check, all right? So that's what they do. So Richard Mogger said this, in general, dates in the correct ballpark are assumed to be correct. What was the correct ballpark for the moon rocks? I think I told you. Three to four and a half billion before they ever got there. Okay, that's what they decided. That's what they published ultimately. But those in disagreement with other data, like 6,000 versus 28 billion on their original dating of the moon rocks, uh, it, in disagreement, they're seldom published, nor are the discrepancies fully explained. No, they didn't explain anything. They just published three to four and a half billion. That was NASA. All right, Grand Canyon, a whole lot of water over a little bit of time. No. Yes. A whole lot of water over a little bit of time. That's what did it. Now the evolutionists have decided that's what did it. The Sahara Desert. I'm just touching on a few of these things. Uh, it's been growing, okay? It's still growing. Desertification. And how they've measured the wind and how it does it and all these kinds of things. They think the Sahara is about 4,000 years old. Well, that would put it pretty much when the flood has dried out. And the oceans are beginning now to cool down again. And the increased uh, wind flows would be coming across there. And so that fits with the young earth right there after the flood. A point in Robertson effect, our sun's like a big vacuum cleaner sucking up all kinds of dust and little meteoroids and all kinds of things every day. I don't know who measured this. I mean, how do they know? Estimated 100,000 tons of space dust. Who does that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. But that's what they say. So our, our solar system should have been swept clean by now. It's not. OK, it's just not. And so then you have a bent rock strata. Uh, thousands of feet thick sometimes. They're bent and they're folded into tight curves. Well, you can't do that with hard rock, OK? Geologists claim they're, they're solidified hundreds of millions of years before they were bent. 
That can't be. Since the bending occurred without cracking the rock, these formations must have been formed while the rock was still soft. That would have been right after the flood. Bending must have occurred shortly after deposition. No need for millions of years. Yep, that's true. How about rapid decay of biological material, such as DNA? They tell us, well, DNA, maximum 10,000 years. That's why they're still looking for it in those dinosaur bones. Okay, they think they're going to, they've already found some. Uh, can't be. Stalactites. Okay, how long does it take to grow a stalactite? Well, there's Carlsbad Caverns. It says tiny drops of water over millions of years. Well, that's what they want you to think. What if there was a whole lot more water coming down there after the flood? I'm sure there was. And it was full of different minerals. They could have been formed overnight. Well, here's some. Under the Lincoln Memorial, built in 1922, some of these are more than eight feet long. It doesn't take thousands of years to make stalactites. Oh, there's one two inches long. 1926, 27, that's Fort Pickens. Uh, did that get destroyed in that hurricane? I don't know if it's still there or not. We used to go there. Oh, there's a nice one. That was 40 years old. And then this picture down there in uh, Australia. Uh, look at those things. Long things when they pumped this out and started to mine it and everything else. 13-inch stalactite. Uh, that w when was that one? 1993. It doesn't take thousands and thousands of years to grow stalactites. Matter of fact, uh, up in uh, Manitou Springs, Colorado, which was where I was for 16 years with Summit Ministries, there's a cave there. I don't know, Cave of the Winds? Is that what that one is? It's got a, it's a cave. And they, you get down the elevator, they take you down this corridor, they say, oh, it took thousands of years, look at this. And they'll show you stalactites were either dry or with a little drop of water on the end. They don't tell you. Go down this corridor, and you have electrical wires that the stalactites form so fast on them, they have to scrape them off or they'll break the wires. But they don't take you down that channel. We live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. All right, oil, pump out 20,000 pounds pressure, and you get a gusher. Uh, shouldn't be. Shouldn't be if it's been there for millions of years. Polonium halos in coal deposits. What does that mean? Well, these are just these little halos, so there was a little speck of radioactive uranium, I think it was, or polonium with it right there, and it gets trapped. A fellow named Gentry did a lot of work on this. He's never been answered by the evolutionary community, by the way. So, what does it mean? Well, Gentry said this, Extraordinary values admit the possibility both the initial uranium infiltration and coalification could possibly have occurred within the past several thousand years. Well, yeah, because if it was molten rock, like the evolutionists say, that's how it all got started, you wouldn't form a halo, it'd be destroyed. If the rock was already cold, how are you going to get the radioisotope in there? It's like God put his fingerprint all through, especially the basement granite. It's just all through there with these little polonium halos. Amazing. Robert Gentry. Radio, ha radio Halos in Coalified Wood. That's one of his books. You can find more, I'm sure. Okay, now, radiation from Jupiter and Saturn. It's still, it's still radiating all this stuff. They haven't been there long enough to cool off. Now, these are evidences that this whole system we live in is not billions of years old. Even though probably 80% of the people in the average church believe in the billions of years. <coughs> because you've never heard the other side of the story. There's a whole other side to this story, which we haven't been permitted to hear. Uh, there's not enough helium in our atmosphere. They know how helium is made and all that. There's not. That indicates that we're in a young earth with a young atmosphere. Bristlecone pine trees. Well, they say, well, we've got some bristlecone pines. We counted the rings. They're 5,000 years old. Oh, you Christians, you say there was a flood that covered the earth about 44, 4,500 years ago. You see, you're wrong. Your Bible's wrong. We have the trees. We've counted the rings. Well, what they don't tell you is trees can have more than one ring on any given year, usually dependent on a, the amount of water. And so last year, just this last summer, we went in Rockwall. We went for almost three months. No rain. The trees went dormant. They were even dropping leaves. Then you get a rain. Some of them bloom again. Two rings this year, okay? 
So just because someone says, we counted the rings on this tree, that proves your Bible is wrong. No, it just proves that trees can have more than one ring on any given year. Um, let's skip carbon-14 for right now. And uh, we'll look here at uh, rivers. I think that's 280. Let's see. Yeah, rivers. Rivers are young. Now, how do they know? Well, they measure the growth of the deltas on these rivers, okay? So, you know, the Mississippi, they say it can't be more than 5,000. Doesn't have to be 5,000, but it can't be more than about 5,000. What about Niagara Falls? Well, Niagara Falls, they're watching it. They're watching it. They measured it as it goes back. Same thing. Can't be more than 5,000. Well, I would say it's probably more like 4,400. After the flood, there it went. Uh, continental erosion. If continents have existed for a billion years, as the evolutionists tell us, erosion must have been vastly different in the past because they can measure erosion rates. And when they measure it, what do they find out? Well, if we're like... The, all the continents, they could have eroded down flat in about 14 million years. Okay? And, but, so, but we're supposed to believe it's three to four and a half billion years old. No way. Just looking at erosion. And then you start thinking about, well, what's in the ocean? Uh, they estimate about 20 billion tons of sediment are washed into the ocean every year. Now, once again, I have no idea. Does anybody know how they calculate that? Who is doing this? <laughs> I don't know, but somebody is. <laughs> One billion tons a year is carried under the continents by tectonic subduction. This means 19 billion tons are building up on the ocean floor, but global sediment on average is about 400 meters deep. Where's all the sediment? If they've measured it's coming in this much, there should be poof, bunches of it. Nope, not there. So it had to be within the last 5,000 years those oceans started getting all this. Elements entering the ocean. Oh, that, so they measure copper, gold, tin, lead, silicon, mercury, uranium, and nickel. And what do they say? Well, the Earth has to be much younger than even a million years for what we have of those particular uh, things in there. So it can't be a million. It doesn't have to be a million, but it can't be. It has to be younger than that. And then we have the winding dilemma, winding up dilemma. Our galaxy is supposed to be 10 billion years old. It should be a featureless disk of tightly wound stars based on the measurable speeds of the star's rotation around the galactic centers. But our galaxy is spiral in shape. It must be less than a few hundred million years old. Not enough time for evolution, by the way. It doesn't have to be a few hundred million. Of course, 6,000 years or less than millions. Uh, then you have, where are the supernova remnants? Uh, we're told, astronomers tell us, maybe uh, one supernova every 25 years. Uh, and that's kind of fascinating. So only about 200 supernova remnants have ever been discovered. And, and some of those are guesses, by the way. And that means our universe must be less than 7,000 years old. About 6,000 is right. Isaiah 40, what's it say? Not one star fails. Not one star is missing. So we need some young people... If you're interested in astronomy, you go to the Bible first and see what it says. By the way, he never calls our sun a star. Have you ever noticed that? The sun, the moon, and the stars. The greater light and the lesser light. What if our sun is not a star? Well, you know what? One of my friends with NASA, he said, you know what? We made some mistakes. We thought the stars were like our sun. So we studied our sun to find out what's going on with the stars. Now that we got the Hubble telescope up and we can see the stars better. My phone is dinging in my ears. I thought I turned it off. You can't hear it, can you? No, but it's in my hearing aids. Oh, it's President Trump. No, there you go. No, here we go. Ignore. Thank you. No, I don't want to talk to you right now. I'll see you. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 40:26. Not one star is missing. Well, then there's got to be something there. Even if a supernova does happen, there's still something there that has a name because God says he names all the stars. Isaiah 40, one of the Psalms. Was it 147? I can't remember. He's got a name for all the stars. How many stars are there? 
A trillion, trillion is the biggest number I've heard. He has a trillion, trillion words to name the star. Best English dictionaries, about 1,400,000 words, including technical language. I've said this for 20 years or so. If all of us sat here the rest of our lives and thought up nonsense syllables, geep, goop, broop, bop, boop, whatever we could think of, okay, we couldn't come up with a tenth of one percent if we did that our whole lifetime. And God has a name for every star, and not one is missing? What kind of a God do we have? He's a God that demands and deserves our worship. All right, what else do we have here? Our receding moon, I mentioned that. As far as I'm concerned, it ought to be out of sight. Uh, what's another time clock? Our spin rate. They've been measuring it. It's slowing down, but you know what happened this summer? It started to speed up. What? Yes, yes. Okay. By the way, just measuring the rate as it's slowing down, four and a half billion years ago, the earth would have been spinning so fast, it would have disintegrated. It would have shot us right off of here. All right. So it cannot be old. But we got this other problem now. Here was something came out. World news. Um, Earth races to complete its revolution in less than 24 hours. Sign of sight, recent day, 1.5 milliseconds shorter. That was on the 4th of August. Now, why is that important? Well, look what it says in Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Could God be beginning to slow it, I mean, to speed it up, so that the days are shortened? They were all shocked. It slowed down last summer. Now, I haven't looked into this. I don't know. Does anybody keep up with this? What's going on? I don't know. So I got to get up to date on that. Is, is it so much a day? What's going on here? By the way, do you know Jesus as your Savior? He may be coming soon. Do you believe he did things like he says he did it? That's important too. All right, there's all these things, all these things that we could say. Uh, but I want to get on to a little bit here on uh, uh, creation, using it for evangelism. Okay, now, just this one. Atheistic evolution asserts, by faith, there is no designer, creator, God. I read you Luantin and Wald and, and Bozarth and some of those guys. Therefore, purposeless, can't be any purpose behind it because there's no mind behind it. Non-directed, accidental, mindless, chance, Random processes produce the universe and everything animate and inanimate in it. The Big Bang created space and time. That's what they believe. How can an explosion create space? Doesn't the space have to be there for the explosion to go somewhere? How can an explosion produce time? God says, I created time in the beginning. That's when time started, okay? And we're heading for eternity, too. It's a long time. All right, now I'm going to get out of this, and we're going to jump over to a little bit different program, and we're going to have to pick up the pace. Which one is it? This one. Ah, good. Okay, so we will go here. Uh, creation science, a powerful discipleship an evangelism tool, and it really is. It really is. But you've got to believe God is the creator and that he did create like he says he did. And if you're convinced of that, it's a great tool. Okay, so Christianity is not a religion. Remember, it's a relationship with the creator, savior, the Lord Jesus. We are not a religion. Every other system is a religious system. You're working your way to heaven somehow. That's a religious system. We have a relationship with the living God. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. What's our job then? 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. 
You got an answer? Now, you should have an answer on this creation evolution controversy after four weeks. I should just start pointing and saying, okay, tell me something. Tell me. I won't do that. All right, the job of our Christians, Jude 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered un unto the saints. By the way, this is only like 30 years after Jesus walked the earth. And the, and the saints are already having to be uh, appealed to. Come on, you guys. Get out there and contend for the faith. Well, how about you? You see? Have you shared the gospel this week? Have you had any divine appointments? Yeah, we all have. What do we do with it? Are you keeping any gospel tracts or anything in your pocket that you can share with someone and say, hey, uh, let me tell me something here. And uh, see, what are we doing? Are we contending for the faith? Now, see, I'm on my last night, so I can leave town soon. <laughs> all right. So what's our job? Mark 16, he said to them, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I really think that's because in the last days, we're not going to know. Is this a human? Or is this some sort of a robotic something? Or some sort of a animated, who knows what, chimera? You know, they're mixing up the genes, the human genes, with animal genes, with uh, human-generated genetic material. What? We aren't going to know for sure who we're... So just share it with every creature. That's what God says. That's what I think anyway. All right, Ephesians 2, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're his workmanship. What is that? Root Greek word for poetry. When we're walking in the spirit, in the works God prepared for us, we are his expression of poetry to the watching world. What kind of a poem are you presenting to the watching world? There's two kinds of poetry. One kind is you read it once and you say, Ugh, I'm not going to, I'll never read that one again. Or you read a poem and it's, whoa, I'm going to have to read that one again. You see, what kind of poetry are you showing the world? Dads, what kind of poetry are you showing your family? Moms, young people, how, what kind of poetry? I'm preaching. Let's keep moving. Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Am I in the right program? I am. Okay. Foundational to using creation science for discipleship or evangelism is for the one with the message to know the Lord Jesus so personally that whether sharing the gospel or being involved in discipleship of others, you know Christ Jesus is your very life. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 3.4, refer to this. When Christ who is our life. This is not my life. This is not my life. What am I? I'm dead. That's what God says of us Christians, doesn't he? You receive Jesus, you're dead. Now you're a new creature, okay? Uh, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, Colossians 3, 4. When we fully understand Jesus is our life, how should we view life? Well, we should view life like this. My life is perfect. My circumstances stink. But this is not my life. My life is perfect because Christ is my life. That's what we're how we're supposed to think. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is not just our means to salvation. He's our very life. Many times Christians are only experiencing God's grace because we're not choosing to experience his life. Jesus doesn't promise to improve us. He promises to indwell us. It's his life. When we fail to know the Lord Jesus as our very life, evangelism and discipleship can become humdrum, just something we do to be obedient to Scripture, to give us a bit of a feeling of worth for a time. No, we do it because it's Jesus' life. That's what he does. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is not just our means to salvation. He's our very life. When we embrace the unsaved world with the perspective that eternal life is not a place we enter into somewhere in the future, 
but it's a person that enters into us as Christians. Jesus is eternal life. When we have discipleship conversations, pointing those around us to God's grace in their lives and His peace and love and fulfillment, if we don't know Him as life, we'll share only part of the whole picture of the sanctification process. We have a Savior now. His indwelling life enables us to walk through life in the power of the Comforter and the Helper. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, was sent to indwell us and be our Helper. What did Jesus say in John 14, 16? I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Amen. And He does. We're sealed in Him. What did He say? I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Yeah, nothing that has eternal value. It's only as Jesus works through us. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves, to think of anything as of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Yeah, it's not me. I don't pull myself up by my bootstraps. No. It's reckoning myself dead and putting on Jesus. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 3, 32, 27. No. He said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Luke 18, 27. That's true. Our heart cry then should be that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection. It lives in each of us as Christians, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Yes, indeed. So, once I'm a Christian, it's not my life anymore, but Christ living his life through me, if I'll allow him to do that. Jesus did not come to solve our problems, but to be our very life. Living from Jesus enables living for Jesus. Look what I did for Jesus. Doesn't mean anything. What I do from him is what counts. It's Jesus coming through me. So we got to believe Jesus is the creator and that he is also the savior. And almost everyone loves animals. I, I did have everyone loves animals and somebody said, I don't. <laughs> so I changed it to almost everyone loves animals. <laughs> Saves a little grief. Anyway, um, Job 12, what's it say? But now ask the beasts, they shall teach thee. The fowls of the air, they'll tell thee. Speak to the earth, it'll teach thee. Fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Yes, indeed. When we study the slow loris, or the weta, or the eye eye, or the nudibranchs, and we're face to face with these creatures that no way they could evolve. They had to have a creator. The Lord hath wrought this. So, using creation science for evangelism. Most everyone loves animals, sharing the gospel in a way that can sometimes be intimidated to us, intimidating to us. It takes us out of our comfort zone. Yeah, it does me. The more we're forced out of our comfort zone, the more we, we are thrust into living out the truths of John 15, 5, abiding, and 2 Corinthians 3, 5, desperate dependence on God. That's what he wants. God is not necessarily looking to work with our competency, but through our dependency. Oh, God, I can't do this. You're right. I can. I never said you could. I'd, I'll do it. We need to be careful not to assume that he only calls the equipped. Perhaps more than we realize, he is equipping the called as we humbly submit to his plan for our lives. Too often we think he'll use us according to how well we believe we are equipped. Nope, that's not how he does it, usually. Our God uses animals to stimulate interest in him, their creator. People, for the most part, love animals. Isaiah 42, Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath to the people upon it. He's giving you your breath right now. Have you thanked him? When's the last time you thanked him for your breath? I mean, you're still here, right? You're still breathing. Let's start thanking him for these things. And spirit to them that walk therein. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. All right. Let's say you decide, I'm going to go out. I'm going to share the gospel with someone. And so you pray, Lord, uh, I'm praying for a divine appointment. 
what do you do? Pray first, okay? Pray first. And if you go out with the family, and then all of a sudden you find someone in the family is talking to someone about Jesus, you are the prayer team. And you are the one praying for them, okay? We do it as a team. So, what? With the creation evangelism, establish there is a creator. Talk about an animal. Look, no way that thing could evolve. Had to have a creator. Talk about a giraffe. Why it doesn't blow its brains out when it bends its head down to get a drink of water, okay? Uh, Start talking about something in creation, a creature, a plant, stars, uh, anything that you think you could even say just a little bit about, that's all you need. Be sure to choose something you're comfortable talking about. And then be ready to use that created thing to point people toward the creator, at least to plant some thoughts, maybe even a doubt about evolution. If they choose to stop listening to you after you explain some amazing design in some aspect of God's creation and they walk away, what do you do? Oh, boy, did I mess that one up. Ah, uh, no. You pray for them as they walk away that God will plant some doubts about evolution or pop plant some things. Maybe I need a savior. Maybe I really do. Uh, Depend on the power of prayer for the fruit to come. Uh, We were down at, we're in Rockwall. We were down there at the lake there where everybody goes on a Saturday night. And we are passing out animal cards. I thought I had one right there. And uh, so I passed out. uh, Here comes these three teenage guys. Look like high school guys. And uh, Oh, there, nope. And I had a Weta. I thought I had a Weta, but I don't have a Weta, but that's okay. I had a Weta, and so I had one, each, each guy a card. I said, hey guys, here, here's something you might find interesting. It's, it's about an animal. They need a creator, and so that, all three took one. Well, this one guy got the big bug. Okay, the Weta, it's like a big bug. And he says, I hate bugs. And he threw it on the ground and stomped on it and twisted it like this. Now, he's showing off for his buddies. He's trying to irritate me. Okay, we know that. So we're just friends, Lord. Help us to love him. And uh, then he looks at me like, okay, what are you going to do about that, buster? You know? And his buddy says, I'd like to read about that. So he bends down and picks it up. So this guy's going to hear about the bug anyway. Uh, We don't get discouraged. God has all of it. He loves us to even say two or three words about him to someone. 1 Peter 4, 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, oh, we're so sad. No, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Yeah, we'll take as much of that as we can get. On the other part, on their part, he's evil spoken of. But on your part, he's glorified. Amen. All right, what else? Well, if they continue to show some interest as you talk to them about this created design, you're not trying to make them into a creationist. You're you're trying to get some conversation going so you can get it to the gospel, get it to Jesus, get it to the creator. That's the whole idea. And it's it's amazing how many times that happens. It's easy. It's just easy. Explain to them that the Bible tells us Jesus Christ is the creator that gives him the authority to be the redeemer and the savior because we are his created being. Uh, You might explain some interesting creation science evidence that points to a young earth. Yeah. Once you establish that earth may be young, you can start establishing that evolution is not the answer. There is a creator. That is the answer. We call these Achilles heels of evolution, the soft dinosaur tissue. You can talk about that. Hey, did you know they have dug up some dinosaur bones, didn't have time to fossilize? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, they even found red blood cells, elastic tissue in there. No, no way. Yeah, so they only could have been buried a few thousand years ago. That, you know what? That was probably at the flood of Noah's day. Noah's day flood. I don't believe in that. Well, that's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. And by the way, the Bible also says Jesus is the creator. And it just easy. Just take it right into it. Don't give them time to argue with you. Anyway, all kinds of things here you can talk about. Talking about creatures, created things, science that supports a young earth can easily lead into the gospel because the creator and the redeemer are one and the same. All right, dogs. You might, we have our dog card. Some of you already got it. And uh, that's really popular. People really like that. And but Okay, so you go out and walk the dog. And here comes somebody else walking their dog. And you got a dog card. You can say, here, you want to, there's a few information bits here about dogs. Would you, yeah, nobody's going to turn you down. 
They might even click on the QR code when they get back in their house. It takes them right to the gospel. That's the whole idea. Uh, they have all kinds of fascinating things about them. And uh, they can be spoiled. We have one. Um, you know, they can smell... They can smell a melanoma before the doctors can even spot it. They've got these dogs trained to, to sniff out a melanoma. Very, very serious cancer. Okay, I've had one on my back. And, uh, I mean, amazing what they can do. Uh, and by the way, they read your face, dogs. They might be one of the only animals that does that. And they know by looking at your face. Oh, he's angry. Oh, they're sad, and they'll come over and they'll put their paw on your arm, and oh, they sympathize, okay? They're one of the very few animals that do that. I don't know if a cat does that. <laughs> anyway, so what do we do? We ask questions. That's the easiest way to do this. Oh, hey, you look intelligent. So uh, you're walking along, and here comes three guys, and they look like they're probably 12 years old, and they're walking along here. Hey, you guys, you look intelligent. And they'll perk up right away. Oh, mm -hmm. And uh, you say, can you name an animal that steals its defense mechanism? And they'll say, what? <laughs> can you name an animal that steals its def this defense mechanism? No. Is there one? Yeah. Yeah, it's called a nudibranch. Some of the most beautiful animals on planet Earth. They're a sea snail. They don't have a shell. Everything can see them, and everything in the ocean is hungry but they eat anemones and they eat jellyfish with those stinging cells and they don't set off the stinging cells. They're called nematocysts. And you touch it, bang, it shoots you. No, 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 they don't set it off. There's a PhD in marine biology for someone. They swallow it. They digest what they want to digest. And then they have this little bunch of these little stinging cells. Our creator put tubes in them that go out to their skin, up in their gills, and they put those stinging cells in the tubes, they go up into their skin, up into their gills, and that becomes their defense mechanism. By the way, if a fish tries to bite a nudibranch, they'll only do it once. They will never again try to bite a nudibranch because they get a mouthful of stingers. Okay, and they remember, they remember. And they can tell that's a nudibranch, whether it looks the same or not. What? You think what God has done. Um, hey, have you ever heard of an eye eye? Eye eye? No, never, never heard of an eye eye. Well, that's an interesting little creature. It's got a middle finger that looks like a piece of wire coming out of its hand. You see that one? Where's my thing? Here it is, right there. You see that right there? That is how it digs the grubs out of the trees, because there are no woodpeckers in Madagascar. So God made a primate to get the wood, to get, do what woodpeckers do. It chews into the trees, gets the grubs, has lunch. How did that evolve? There's no other primates like that. Where'd that come from? You see, evolution has no answer for these things. That's why most people never heard of an eye eye. They can't, they can't explain it using evolutionary terms. God built all these things into the creation to show I did it. And there's no question. And then we give him glory and we give him praise. That's what he wants. Uh, have you ever heard of a creature that freezes up solid in the winter and thaws out and walks away? Yeah, it's a wetter. That's it. That's what that guy there at Lake Ray Hubbard stamped on. Stamped on or stomped on? Stomped on? Stoop. He, he crushed. Okay. All right. Did you know a fox uses Earth's magnetic field to catch mice under two feet of snow? How many of you knew that? Yeah, you're not allowed to know these kinds of things. They get, if they, there's two feet of snow. There's a mouse crawling around under two feet of snow. You can't see it, but the fox can hear it, okay? And the fox organizes it so the mouse, here's the fox, here's the mouse, and if the fox can get it so the mouse is directly in a line with magnetic north, he's using magnetic north to help catch his lunch. So here's the fox, Here's the mouse under two feet of snow. There's magnetic north. North. He jumps and dives into the snow, comes up with it 73% of the time. Where's that come from? 
How does evolution explain that? See, they don't. They don't have explanations. That's why they don't tell you about these things. They don't want you to know that. We live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. The fox is irreducibly complex. It needs all its parts. And it goes kabam down there, comes up with a mouse or a vole. Amazing, just amazing. All right, I don't have time for sea otters and hummingbirds. Uh, what about the giraffe? Why don't it blow its brains out when it bends its head down to get a drink of water? Okay, I'll show you one quick uh, example of how this works. All right, so we're up in Pennsylvania, and uh, the girls needed something, and we, walk, we drive by this mall, so they go in the mall. I'm going to take a nap in the van. While they're going into the mall, coming out of the mall is this gothic gang. And this gothic gang comes out and goes around behind the bushes. I'm in the van. I want to take a nap. It's like God is saying, I don't hear a voice, but Job, go talk to him. And I'm saying, no way. <laughs> I'm not going behind the bushes with that bunch. I'll never come out alive. <laughs> no, nope, go talk to him. Okay. So I walk in. I'm praying. Pray first. I'm praying. Okay, Lord, I have no idea what to say. Here, I'm, I'm all dressed up because I got to speak that night. They're all like they are. I'm going to put a different one up there. And um, so I get behind the bushes and I say, uh, and they're smoking something. There were 12 of them to start with. Hey, uh, y'all hanging out? <laughs> that was dumb. I mean, what? one of them says, what's it look like? And I said, my second question, uh, hey, uh, how do y'all know each other? Do y'all go to the same church? <laughs> <laughs> one of them says, no way. I said, well, how do you know each other? And one of them says, our moms drop us off every Saturday afternoon so we could have our fun together. Okay? So they formed a gothic gang because their moms are dropping them off looking like that. Okay? And uh, I said, well, let me ask you another question. Do any of you know why a giraffe doesn't blow its brains out <laughs> when it bends its head down to get a drink of water? And one of them said, who cares? <laughs> Another one said, I'd like to know. <laughs> I had an hour with those kids. We went through several animals. We went through the gospel. Okay. And uh, now at the end of the hour, uh, we had gone through a lot. And I said, well, what do y'all do just for fun? And so two of them jumped up and they start doing this with each other with their hands, you know, and then two more jumped up. So now there's four of them. They're going here and here and here and here and here. Then they start jumping. And, and one of them said, well, come on, join us. <laughs> okay, what am I going to do? I get up there too. So I start, well, here I am. They come walking out of the mall. <laughs> this is a true story. And there's dad with these gothic kids jumping up like this and clapping hands. <laughs> Oh, yeah, while we were there, two policemen come back behind the bushes. <laughs> What's going on back here? I said, oh, it's okay. Uh, we're talking about uh, God and Jesus and the Creator. Oh, keep it up, buddy. And they turned around and left. <laughs> and then by the time we finished, there were 22 of them. I don't know where they all came from, okay? It all started with a giraffe. See? Just one animal. Oh, well, at a, another point in there, one of them said, is there anything written about these animals? And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ran back to the van and got a whole armload of stuff, brought it back. They didn't go away. They waited. Using God's creation to share the gospel. It, it's easy, and it works, okay? And you really, you don't only have to know about one animal. You, you don't even have to know. Take some animal cards. And just hand them to people. Check them out at Walmart. Give them, a, give them an animal card. Paying the bills this month, okay? Stick an animal card in, okay? There's all kinds of ways to use it. You don't even have to say anything. All right, so that's enough. So we want to ask questions. And my time is up. Um, well, let's stop uh, well, we have a thing here called the conclusion. Let's see what that says. Okay, conclusion, okay. Uh, know with conviction that Jesus Christ 
is not only your Savior, but He is your Creator, God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of Jesus, created everything. And you have to know with conviction, His Word in Genesis is literally true. Okay? you got to start there. Get some comfort zone creation facts ready to present to whomever the Lord brings into your pathway, and He will. Pray first. That's the rule. As you're walking into a witnessing situation, pray. Your goal with creation science evangelism, engage people with a creation science fact of some kind. What's the goal? Get it to Jesus. That's the whole idea. And it's easy. You say, I don't know, maybe it is for you, but it isn't for me. That's the devil telling you that. Okay? It is easy. We don't like to do it either. But God says, yeah, you do. Come on, come on, come on. It's me. It's me. It's not you. You're dead. Okay? You're dead. Jesus, I, this is what we're going to do today because it's me. It's not you. And he gives you the words to say. All right. Now, so we need to be given an answer. All right? And we will get reproached from time to time. But he says, happy are ye. We don't get dejected. And blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from the company, and when they shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. What are you supposed to do? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. What? That sounds like a terrible situation to be in. No. What do we do? Because of the name of Jesus. Okay? Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. Okay, I'll tell you one more quick story. I will have to be quick. Okay, I was at Summit Ministries, Manitou Springs, Colorado, for 16 years. One year, we, we went through these verses. And here's a young man. I think he was 17. He might have been 16, but he'd never shared the gospel with anybody in his whole life, okay? And he saw this verse and decided he's going to go down to Manis Manitou Springs and share the gospel. So he took his Bible, a couple of buddies, they go down there. This is an old hippie town up there in Colorado. The hippies, they sit on the curb and you try to talk to them and their eyeballs are doing this because they listen to the wrong people and took the wrong drugs. And Anyway, so he finds this old hippie and he sits down beside him and he, he opens his Bible, points to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then the hippie's listening. He turns to 5.8, but God commands his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the old hippie grabs his Bible out of his hands and starts tearing the pages out and throwing them in the street. And this guy looks at his buddies. He says, I think we're getting reproached for the name of Christ. Let's leap for joy. So they start leaping for joy in front of this old hippie. <laughs> he probably thought he was having a flashback or something. And uh, what's it say to do? We don't get discouraged. We trust God. He wants us to tell people about him. What are we here for as a Christian? Tell people about Jesus and make disciples. So I want to thank you for having me these four weeks. And we didn't get to everything I wanted to, but we got to the things the Lord got us to. And does anybody have a question right at the end? Good. So <laughs> we, uh, we have to come five minutes late. And uh, Jeff said, whatever you do, only go to midnight. So we'll stop. <laughs> and, uh, but I do. I want to thank you all for having us. We've enjoyed being with you all. You've been a very um, supportive audience. And you haven't thrown tomatoes at me. And that's what we get some places in churches. All right? Not real tomatoes, but verbal tomatoes. So I, we want to thank you. You've encouraged us. You really have. And I'll say a little prayer. Father, I just thank you that we could spend time together here for four weeks. Bless Believer's Chapel. Bless these folks, Father, their families. May uh, everybody for sure know Jesus as their Savior. And if they don't, maybe even today, they would get that straightened out. Put their faith and trust in Jesus so that all of us will be in heaven together one of these days. And then, Father... Help us to go out here into this wicked and dark and perverse generation and just have the gospel on the tip of our tongues. Let's radiate Jesus to this needy world. Thanks again, Father, for enabling us all to be here in Jesus' name. Amen.